wasn't, oh, if you need a handout, you can slip your hand up, or they're also in your bulletin. They're free, and I highly recommend uh, grabbing one. But it's your choice. And I wasn't going to start with this, but that song, You're All I Want. How many like that song? All right, You're All I Want. Amen. And I do believe the songs we sing affect the lives we live, so music is really important. But I worked for two summers at a camp in Millersburg, Ohio, and I had a, I have a good friend who's just been my friend, and Lord willing, under the sun, he'll be my friend uh, for a long time. I don't know who will die first, but we'll be in heaven forever together. And he always sharpens and encourages me. And he's a lepidopterist. Anybody know what a lepidopterist is? Um, he collected butterflies. And during chapel one night, hot summer night, there's a moth uh, flying around and we're singing this song, You're All I Want. I think I was playing drums actually. And uh, he told the staff this the next day. And he's singing, You're All I Want, but he's really distracted by this uh, butterfly. And then he's like, oh, that moth, I really want that moth. I'm sorry, God, and he just like repented and, and felt really bad, and then he really challenged us to think about the words we're singing when we sing, because um, God was all he wanted. He also wanted that butterfly, but that's just a story from Josh Haas. He's a good friend who sharpens me. So, praise the Lord. That's in conclusion. <laughs> just kidding. All right, today we're continuing through the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, this is message 20 in Ecclesiastes, and I've been amazed by Solomon's journal. All right, this is uh, Solomon's insights about life that he passes on to us. It's a work of art. We've spent plenty of time setting up the context of this book, but it's a really important book. It's very realistic, and the truths in Ecclesiastes in Ecclesiastes are timeless meaning they endure through different languages, through, through the years under the sun, but they're also timely. All right, some of this stuff is hilarious that we're going to be reading today. All right, and it could get me fired, honestly. Ecclesiastes 10.8 through 11.8, there's some heavy stuff that might disagree with a lot of Baptist churches, but we've got to follow God's word, amen? All right, not Josh's words, God's word. That's the key. All right, and... Wisdom literature, just a reminder, it artistically uses words, phrases, and ideas to make a point. Right? To make a point. It's very important. Artists make points. And as a church, if we want to see the world transformed, we need faithful artists who are willing to make points to the glory of God. Um, how badly we need awesome, inspiring artists like Solomon. Um, we need great artists to God's glory. But Ecclesiastes 10, 8 through 11, 8. And uh, as you're turning there, as you're hopefully getting set up to, to hear from the Lord this morning, I wanted, I wanted to tell you a quick story. I love playing with tracks with my son. And a, a great part of being a dad with a three-year-old is you get to play with their toys. True story. And uh, I always tell my, my wife and, and my mother-in-law when they're going to garage shows, always pick up all the race car tracks and train tracks you can, all right? Because it's so fun. And me and Caleb build these big cities. And it's just so fun. You can, uh, with the track, do really cool stuff like this. Whoa. I still think it's fascinating, OK? But I want you to think about that question. We can go ahead and uh, pick up this screen and look at the cross, if that's all right this morning. But this question is on your discussion handout. Is a track good or bad for a train? And then it unpacks it even further and says, how does a track affect a train? How does it affect a train? Now, go ahead and write in an answer. You know, because when you write it down, there's a little bit of extra accountability. And just think about the freedom of a train. Is a train free? Here is a train on a track. And uh, give Eric Abe, our deacon, um, thanks for this at some point, for this object lesson this morning that he helped set up for us. Here's a train on a track. Everybody ready? Say, I was born ready. <laughs> yeah, camp. 
All right, train on a track. I promise this is relevant. Okay, everybody see that train on the track? Okay, is this train free? Okay, um, I want you to think about that and discuss that this week um, with your family and friends, your neighbors, your co-workers. Hopefully God inspires you with his truth this morning as we study his word. Will you go ahead and stand and we'll read the book, we'll read a portion of the book of Ecclesiastes this morning. Chapter 10, verse 8. He who digs a pit will fall into it, and a serpent will bite him who breaks through a wall. He who quarries stones is hurt by them, and he who splits logs is endangered by them. If the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength, but wisdom helps one to succeed. If the serpent bites before it is charmed, there is no advantage to the charmer. The words of a wise man's mouth win him favor, but the lips of a fool consume him. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is evil madness. A fool multiplies words, though no one knows what is to be. And who can tell him what will be after him? The toil of a fool wearies him, for he does not know the way to the city. Woe to you, O land, when your king is a child, and your princes feast in the morning. Happy are you, O land, when your king is the son of the nobility, and your princes feast at the proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. Through sloth the roof sinks in, and through indolence the house leaks. Bread is made for laughter, and wine gladdens life, and money answers everything. Even in your thoughts do not curse the king, nor in your bedroom curse the rich. For a bird of the air will carry your voice, or some winged creature tell the matter. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Give a portion to seven, or even to eight, for you know not what disaster may happen on earth. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves on the earth. And if a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it will lie. He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. As you do not know the way, the spirit comes to the bones in the womb of a woman with child, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. In the morning sow your seed, and at evening withhold not your hand, for you do not know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike will be good. Light is sweet, and it is pleasant for the eyes to see the sun, so if a person lives many years, let him rejoice in them all, but let him remember that the days of darkness will be many. All that comes is vanity. Let's pray. Father, you are an awesome God. Lord, we ask you to speak to us today through your word that you've written for us. I pray your Holy Spirit would guide everything that is said, everything that is not said, everything that is heard, and especially everything that is applied to our lives. I pray Jesus will be very happy that Jesus will be very exalted today as a result of this time we spend striving to hear from you this morning. We love you. To you be the glory. I pray for much fruit that remains for your glory, for incredible results as a result of this work of hearing what you have to say this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks. You may be seated. The first point on your handout is work. Work that we do. Work that we do. And letter A, chapter 10, verses 8 through 11, is how we're going to break this up first. And the first thing we see is danger. Everybody say danger. danger. Okay, verses 8 through 8 and 9, we see danger. He who digs a pit will fall into it, and a serpent will bite him who breaks through a wall. It's dangerous. Um, this year, at, in our facilities at Pukalani Baptist, Praise the Lord, we live in paradise, right? So that means there's no... Anybody know? What don't we have that Solomon just told us to be aware of? Snakes. No snakes here. Isn't that great? And this year I heard of someone cleaning up um, one of the rooms in our church and there was some mold. All right? And because they were cleaning, I know for a fact, two people had some respiratory issues. All right? So there were some negative 
results of that work. Okay, it was dangerous in a sense, but everybody's recovered and all is well and the room looks great. But there's some danger. Um, when you're digging a pit, you risk falling into it. And when you accomplish pro and progress, often there's pain. Verse 9, he who quarries stones is hurt by them, and he who splits logs is endangered by them. You know, it's dangerous to swing an axe and cut wood. All right? This, this uh, lesson from Solomon um, for us is that there's always risk involved in work under the sun. Unfortunately, there's tragedy where people die, people get hurt. I used to cut trees with my friend Stephen in college, and we ran this huge wood chipper. And praise the Lord, we did not have any major accidents with that wood chipper. Because I would look very different, right? Or I wouldn't be here. Because it's a huge machine and it has gnarly teeth and you throw a piece of wood in and it just chips it and it's incredible. But the more foolish someone is, the worse the consequences will be, the worse the pain will be in life under the sun. Okay, so be careful, but with work comes some pain. Alright, so there's danger. Verse 10, we see that we can work on it. Work on it. O-N is your blank. If you go ahead and write that in. And Solomon says, if the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength. But wisdom helps one to what? Wisdom helps one to succeed, to success. I sat in this library room with Pastor Paul, and he told me this story about this old wise man and this young strong man. And they were working in a field, had to cut trees. And the young strong man and the old man would swing their axes and cut down trees. And the young strong guy is looking over, and he's like, why is that old man taking so many breaks? Can't he see that I'm out here sweating my butt off? Solomon, or, uh, Pastor Paul did not say it, but it's like that. He told it very eloquently. And it helped me. I remember it. But anyway, he said, why is that old man taking so many breaks? And at the end of the day, they look at the work they accomplished, and the old man cut down way more trees than the young, strong man who was swinging away. And at the end of the day, the young man said, I saw you sitting down. How did you cut more trees than me? And he said, young man, son, I was sharpening my axe. Sharpening my axe. Okay, so he was working on his life, not just in his life. He wasn't just struggling through that pain of swinging a dull axe away. He was using a tool, refining that tool, and accomplishing incredible results. So sharpen your axe. Don't just work in your life. It's okay to use tools. It's okay to invest in resources and work together with people to accomplish more. Teamwork makes the dream work. I try to live by that. I think that's good. Yes. Wisdom helps one to succeed. Work on it. And then verse 11, time it right. Verse 11 says, if the serpent bites before it is charmed, there's no advantage to the charmer. All right? So we already talked about timing in our last message, Kukulani Joy, time. And we talked about God's kairos, his perfect divine timing. Okay? And to drive this last point from letter A home, I want you to think about what track you're on this morning. What track are you on this morning? Um, contrary to popular opinion, we're not born on the right track. We are all born um, sinners, both because of the choices we make, but also our, our nature. We are on the wrong track. And Jesus says, don't just live the way you're born. Don't just work on your life and be the best person you can be. You need to be born, what? Are you guys with me, PBC? Okay, Jesus says you don't just need to be born, you need to be born again. Born again. That's such an important truth, and I pray you remember that. John 3, 16, that for God so loved the world that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. And he's explaining to Nicodemus how to be on a different track, how to be born again. Okay, so with God's timing, when the fullness of the time had come, in God's perfect kairos, he sent forth Jesus. And God's plans are incredible. They're way higher than our ways. I always say there's no high like the most high. Solomon says there's nothing new under the sun. I wasn't clever. I didn't come up with that. I heard it and tried to remember it. 
But God's timing, have you heard the expression, all roads lead to Rome? All roads lead to Rome. Some people say that. Well, even the fact that Christianity spread amidst the Roman culture and, and spread, and now it's 2015 A.D. right now, that everybody, July 19th, 2015, because when the fullness of the time had come, God's perfect timing, he sent forth Jesus so we can be on the right track. All right? And my prayer is that if you're just on that track, following your own desires, following the, the world system with Satan as your cheerleader, saying, be yourself, be all that you can be, just stay on track, you can do it, that today would be the day you repent of your sins, turn away from that empty way of life that leads to death and will be the path to hell one day, and trust in Jesus to save you from your sins and be on the track that God wants you to be on. And just an invitation, anybody who wants to, the Bible says in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus, you are Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be blessed. You'll be saved. And I ask you to repeat that because I want you to remember that, church. So that's why we stopped for a second. That time, maybe this is the space set aside right now where you trust Jesus as your Savior and you get off that empty track, that highway to hell, and would get on that highway following God's ways for your life. And now listen to this message as a new creation with a new heart, with new desires, so that you can follow God's ways for your life. So that you can use your time for a purpose to His glory. So that's the end of A. The other points I think will go a little quicker. But uh, first, work. What we do, um, there's danger. We need to work on it. We need to time it right. And then we're going to go ahead and uh, skip to verse 15. Look at Ecclesiastes 10, verse 15. It says, The toil of a fool wearies him. For he does not know the way to the city. Okay? He's just exhausted. And he doesn't know the basic facts, the basic truth that if you sharpen your axe, it'll be easier to cut down the tree. He doesn't even know how to get home, basically, is what Solomon's saying. And it's ultimately ignorance. And that's the I on your handout. That write in I for I, ignorance. And that's, there's a cause and there's an effect. There's a cause and there's an effect. If the, if the fool in this passage had knowledge, he would know how to get to the city. He would know the right way home. He would know how to do the job he's supposed to do. And by the way, I believe Christians should be the best employees your boss has. Because you're working for Jesus, not for your boss. Cause and effect, church. There is cause and effect. If I hit my foot with a hammer, I don't want to do that object lesson for you. But if I were to do that, it would hurt. It might get infected. I could show you a full scar from surfing that I have on my body because I fell and hit the reef. That was the cause, and now it's affected me. All right? Continue. Verse 16. And this is why churches shouldn't just have young pastors who don't know anything, maybe. Okay? Verse 16, it says, Woe to you, O land, when your king is a child and your princes feast in the morning. Okay? They're not aware of that proper timing to, to stop and eat their food and recharge. Instead, they're just eating and drinking and being merry in the morning and they're shirking their responsibilities. And the effect is it messes up the kingdom. Verse 17 says, Happy are you, O land, when your king is the son of the nobility. And your princes feast at the proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. Cause and effect. When there's ignorance, it leads to disaster. Okay? And then we see that disaster. We see that effect more and more. That through sloth, the roof sinks in. Okay? If, if a roof is leaking, you know it hasn't been fixed. Um, and through indolence, the house leaks. So there's laziness, there's complacency, there's neglect. That's the cause, and the effect leads to the roof leaking. It leads to our relationships hurting. If we don't invest the time we get in our relationships, I have not even turned my phone on today. And this is God's grace, because man, I stink at uh, looking at my screen all the time. And my wife showed me a picture recently of a little boy sitting at the table with his daddy, 
and they're sitting down in the chairs, and the table's here, and up between the two boys is this huge iPhone. Or up between the boy and his dad is this, this uh, screened out, blocking the relationship with the dad and the son because of the iPhone. All right? And I, I just tell you that because it's easy to be focused on the things that don't matter the most. And if I were to just be on my phone all the time at home, my marriage is going to stink. My relationship with my kids are, is going to stink. Amen? There's causes and there's effects. And when we're ignorant of that, it doesn't go well for us. And then this wonderful verse, verse 19. Anybody just excited to hear this verse? Okay? Bread is made for laughter and wine God is life and money answers everything. Okay, should we drink? Should we not drink? Does money really answer everything? Should we pay taxes? Should we use credit cards in church and the offering plate? What should we do? All right, I'm not going to answer any of those questions today. I'm going to quote my friend who's in the Czech Republic telling people about Jesus. And he said, Josh, this is his commentary, wisdom from the heart of the Czech. Money fixes stuff under the sun, but it doesn't fix anything internally. Okay? John MacArthur would say that this was a lazy partying king. And he says, uh, man, I've been partying in the morning, so I should just throw money at my problems. And uh, try to solve it. Just, you know, write a check to make the kingdom better. But it doesn't. It doesn't work. Okay? Other people interpret this to say that all three of these are good things. Um, bread, money, and what's the other one? Bread, money, I honestly forget. Yeah. Bread, money, and wine. I really forgot the alcohol one. Um, yeah. Bread, money, and wine. That's surprising because that's been my focus for a lot of the week. All right. Sorry. Um, the, the other thought is that all three of these are good things that shouldn't be abused. That shouldn't be ultimate things. That all three of these things can be gifts, but they're all dangerous, and they shouldn't be focus in our lives as God. Because, you know, alcohol is not going to save anybody. Right? You know, it can mask your problems for a while, but it's not really going to make your problems go away. It might even complicate them. Eating too much isn't going to save you. Okay? It might de-stress you and help you sleep better for the night. I know from experience. <laughs> but it's not going to save your soul. Alright? And neither is the other one. Money. Money is not going to answer all your problems. Amen? Okay, but there are cause and effect with all of those things. And then point C, we should cause an effect. A-N, cause an effect. Okay, we, we hit all those verses, but verse, chapter 11, 1 through 7 says, Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Alright, some believe this relates to maritime commerce, that, uh, Ships should go out, and, and others believe it's, it's a term that means diversify your investments. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. All right? But either way, Solomon's saying just go for it. You know, under the sun, life is short. Let's do that. Maybe five, seven minutes. Probably. Cool. So, guys, in a few minutes, Emmy Abe is going to show us how to invest our lives. All right? She's going to tell us about how she spent her time and money and made an investment, not just under the sun, but eternally. Alright, so that's coming up soon. But, cast your bread upon the waters. Um, go for it. Verse 2, give a portion to seven or even to eight, for you know not what disaster may happen on earth. A proverb says that, um, that have no fear of the disaster that overtakes the wicked. And it also, it talks about how the righteous are as bold as a lion, while the wicked man flees, even though no one pursues him. Alright, so there's a boldness that comes through a right relationship with God, through a humble confidence, that we don't know all the answers. Amen? Alright, some of you maybe have uh, issues with things I've said this morning, and I'll tell you point blank, I don't know all the answers. And I encourage you to study God's Word for yourself, because this endures... All right? The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord endures forever. So Solomon's saying, cause and effect, invest your life. Verse 3, 
If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves on the earth. And if a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it will lie. And this week, um, Nicole and I like to read wisdom literature sometimes. And uh, if it's, you know, July 5th or 6th, the five and six months men are great proverbs to read with the family. I'm just saying. But if it's a Proverbs, if it's a fifth or sixth of a month, we tend to read Proverbs 5 out loud or Proverbs 6 because there's 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs and there's 31 days in a lot of months. So it's a neat thing to do as a family, um, especially five or six if you're a, a guy and a good husband. But we were read, I read this passage to my wife this week and uh, just Ecclesiastes 10.8 through 11.8. And it was kind of like reading a proverb out loud. And I said, hey, what stuck out at you in that passage? And it was this verse um, where it says, if a tree falls in the woods to the north or south, there the tree will lie. What verse was that? Is that verse 3? 11, 9? 11, I'll just double check it. Okay, 11, 3. Um, it says, if a tree falls. And for some reason, that jumped out of her. Okay? And, and Solomon's saying, invest your life. But there's a guy who has written 38 books. Um, he's taught, he's been a professor and taught theology, philosophy, and apologetics. He's the founder and president of this really neat ministry. And his name's R.C. Sproul. And they interviewed him, um, when did you first become a Christian? And this is great for college students. This is great for um, anyone who is young and thinking about the path that they're on with their lives. And he says, how did, somebody asked him, how did you first become a Christian, R.C. Sproul? Here's his answer. I had actually gone to a church-related college, but I went on a football scholarship, not because of any interest in the church. And at the end of my first week, which had been spent in freshman orientation, my roommate and I decided to head out of town to hit some of the bars across the border. Who's gone to the bars across the border? It's wise to remain silent. When you remain silent, people think you're wise. And it's smart. We're going to get to that in a minute. But um, this is what R.C. Sproul decided to do. We come to the parking lot, and I realized that I was out of cigarettes. So I went back in the dorm and went to the cigarette machine. I can still remember it was 25 cents for a pack of Luckies. And I got my Luckies and turned around and saw the captain of the football team sitting at a table. And he spoke to me and to my roommate and invited us to come over and chat. And we did. And this was the first person I ever met in my life that talked about Christ as a reality. I like skateboarders better than football players, but praise God for this captain of the football team. Amen? Sorry for inserting that, but anyway. Praise God for faithfulness to the oikos, wherever God puts you. All right? So the captain of the football team, R.C. Sproul, they're talking. R.C. Sproul says, I've never heard anything like it. And I was just absorbed. I sat there for two or three hours, and he was talking. He didn't give a traditional evangelism talk to me. He just kept talking to me about the wisdom of the Word of God. And he quoted Ecclesiastes 11.3. Whether a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where it falls, there it will lie. I just feel certain I'm the only person in church history that was converted by that verse. <laughs> but my wife liked it too. Great minds, right? Um... God just took that verse and struck my soul with it. I saw myself as a log that was rotting in the woods, and I was going nowhere. When I left that guy's table, I went up to my room, and into my room, by myself, in the dark, I got on my knees and cried out to God to forgive me. And he was saved. He realized cause and effect of life under the sun does not satisfy your soul. And this is the 20th message in the book of Ecclesiastes, and I pray we get that truth. That nothing under the sun will satisfy our souls. And we need a right relationship with Jesus to be on track. And then when we're on it, we're given new hearts. Our hearts are regenerated. The perfect heart surgeon, Jesus, gives us new hearts. And then we're able to let our works and our words, we're working on those by the power of the Holy Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit are demonstrated in our lives. And there's much fruit that remains to God's glory, like the life of R.C. Sproul so far. Cause and effect. Invest your life, church. 
Verse 4 says, He who observes the wind will not sow. He who regards the clouds will not reap. And then just some healthy awe for God here. As you do not know the way the Spirit comes to the bones in the womb of a woman with child, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. He's saying God's way bigger than Josh. You know, I need breath, I need sleep, I need food. I don't accomplish much in the maybe 200 years I'm going to be alive. Just kidding. I don't accomplish much with this life, but God accomplishes so much. God is incredible, and we need that awe and that revelation that only God's work is the work that remains. So, because of that, do stuff. Be wise and try stuff to God's glory. Okay? Um, verse 6. Oh, and just a reminder, like Frankenstein is what I think of with verse 5. That you can try to make, even if scientists could make this great human and that complex eyeball, the complex joints and sinews and muscles and, and make this incredible um, scientific, in a lab, make a person. We still don't know how the spirit of a person comes to a person. What is it that makes you, you? The world would say it's who you are attracted to sexually defines you. That's not what God says. God says there's something mysteriously amazing and you're fearfully and wonderfully made. And that awe should be what drives you. Awe for God should drive us to action. Verse 6, In the morning sow your seed, and at the evening withhold not your hand, for you do not know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike will be good. Try stuff. Verse 7, Light is sweet, and it is pleasant for the eyes to see the sun. If you uh, contrast that with verse 8, darkness refers to death, light refers to life. Life is sweet, it's a gift from God. Your life is not yours to take. Your time, your talents, your treasure, your wealth, your words, your work are all God's, and they're to be invested to His kingdom. Amen? Amen. I'm way more excited than you guys, and it makes me feel awkward. <laughs> But I hope this helps us. There's so many excuses. Excuses are so easy, church. It's so easy to ignore letter C on your handout of this first point of work. And it's so easy to not want to invest our lives. It's so easy to say, Nicole and I thought of some excuses. We're too busy. We're too tired. And these weren't all what we said for us, even though a lot of them are true for us. But look at this list of excuses that are common. We say, too busy, too tired, too poor, unskilled, unqualified, overqualified, too important to, to do that, not important enough to do that, I'm not good enough for that, oh, I'm too good for that. I get asked that all the time, no. I get asked that way too much, no. It's too hot, it's too cold, I'm too young. I'm too old. It's too early to do that. It's too late to do that. Those are just some easy excuses. I encourage you to follow God however He leads you. All right, and then we're going to just go through these last ones and hear from Emmy. But your words, um, your words are the next way we need to be on track this morning according to the wisdom of Solomon. What we say is so important. And Emmy, in a minute, is going to demonstrate that. She's going to use the gift of language to communicate with us her investment to God's glory. Sean did that last week. And I heard of several people watching that message on the internet this week and benefiting from it. Okay? And he was faithful. It didn't fit on a CD. All right? Thomas, our awesome sound person, um, said, shucks, I can't fit Sean's message on a CD. A CD only holds 80 minutes. <laughs> All right? And those are just the facts. But it wasn't easy for him to do that. It was his heart. And he used his words to communicate. Out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth spoke. I sincerely believe that. And I agree with every word he spoke last week. I believe it was biblical, and it was very helpful for me. And I've heard several ways that it's helped people this week to God's glory. And we can use our words. Um, letter A, chapter 10, verses 12 through 14. We see the words of a wise man's mouth win him favor, but the lips of a fool consume him. I just struggle with this so much, and I strive to live this truth. 
Shaw, uh, John Maxwell. This is a, a good quote if you want to write it down, and this is how I'm, I'm trying to apply it this morning. If you want your words to be weighty, then you must weigh them well. One more time. If you want your words to be weighty, you must weigh them well. Verse 13, the beginning of the fool's words, the beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is evil madness. You can't win with a fool. A fool multiplies words, though no one knows what is to be. And Ecclesiastes 5, verse 11 says, the more the words, the less the meaning. And I, you guys have seen that. If I go, for me, um, if I talk too long, you don't hear Okay, because it's distracting and there can be competing ideas. But I work when I put together a message to, to be clear. And, and yet, in our personal lives, the same goes. You know, people that post all kinds of stuff on Facebook so you don't listen to anything they say. I could be one of those persons. <laughs> but we've all got to be faithful to use our words the way God calls us to use them. It's case by, it's case, by case. It's case by case that where, where there's many words, it doesn't make sin go away. And where there's many words, sin is not far. And yet, it's case by case. Some people are called to be rappers to the glory of God and use a lot of words. Just let you pray about that. Rappers. Any rappers here? That'd be great. Okay, weigh your words carefully. This is so ironic and awesome. It has so much potential right now. But, um... The end of verse 14, and we're almost through all these verses. It says, who can tell him what will be after him? Who can tell him? This fool that's just multiplying words, even though he doesn't really know what's going on, he confidently makes a lot of assertions, and yet he doesn't listen. God's given us, the way God created most of us, is with two ears and one mouth. And that's just a very clear object lesson that we should listen more than we talk. When Josh Marburger listens more than he talks, life is better. And probably the same for you. If you want your words to be weighty, you must weigh them well. Weigh your words. That's A, verses 12 through 14. Weigh them. And, and just one last note, Ephesians 4, verse 15. If you want to write that in for letter A. It says, speak the truth and love to one another. So... It's kind of ironic because God wrote 66 books to us. The Bible is a big, thick book. Ecclesiastes is a long book. All right, so in that wisdom literature, there's tension, and it makes a point, and that's the goal. And we need to hear the point that God's making, and the point that anyone's making when they're speaking God's word, we need to hear from the Lord. Amen? So let's do that, church. Weigh your words well, and then be, take every thought captive. Two more verses in Ecclesiastes this morning. 10 verse 20 it says, Even in your thoughts, do not curse the king, nor in your bedroom curse the rich. For a bird of the air will carry your voice, or some winged creature tell the matter. Your parents, your boss, your leaders, don't curse them, even in your room, let alone on the internet. Take every thought captive, is letter B. We need inward honor. And 2 Corinthians 10.5 teaches we've got divine power to demolish strongholds with God's word, by God's spirit. And we need to make every thought obedient to God. Those thoughts that you're worthless, you're hopeless, you're helpless. Pastor Paul, even though he's not here, says that to us today, right? If you hear the word that you're hopeless, worthless, or helpless, that's a lie from the pit of hell. And those are demonic thoughts that we need to take captive and not listen to them. And that's why even in our bedroom, even in our bed that the covers pulled up over our heads, don't listen to the lies of the enemy and don't curse your leaders. Because then your heart changes as you give power to those thoughts with words and people can tell where your heart is. Eventually it might impact what you say, but even if you don't say it, the spirit by which you communicate will cause a lot of problems. So it's wisdom from Solomon. Even in your thoughts, don't curse the king. Even in your bedroom. Okay? Because word gets around. Last verse. 11, verse 8. 
And I'm amazed that we got through all this material because it's a thick section of scripture. Pray and thank God with your life and lips. Pray and thank God. PT. Anybody done PT training? Anybody had to take a PT test? Any police department or firefighters here? Had a PT. Am I using that word right? PT? Yep. Yeah? Okay, physical training. It's of some value. It's important. But our spiritual training, life under the sun, we need that physical training. We should take care of our bodies and invest our time in the gym. But spiritually, we need to be praying and thanking God. That's the work that we need to do. When my wife and I were married on our wedding brochure was enjoy the ride. Philippians 4, 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. Say it again. Rejoice. Rejoice. That's just scripture. I wasn't even being that. Praise God. <laughs> Say it again. Rejoice. 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 That's how I did it on purpose. But let your reasonableness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Prayer and thanks. And we see that in Ecclesiastes. Chapter 11, verse 8. Again, light of life in verse 7. Darkness of death. Your life is not yours to take. Don't ever take your life. Talk about the wickedness of suicide with those around you. Because God has given you a life for a purpose. And yet realize that life is short. Don't waste your time. Verse 8 says, So if a person lives many years, let him rejoice in them all. Do that PT of praying and thanking God, rejoicing. But let him remember that the days of darkness will be many, and all that comes is vanity. Life is short. Make it count. We've talked about that word hevel there. It's a vapor. You see somebody smoking a cigarette. That smoke that's in the air, as long as it's there, Solomon, the artist, would make the point that's as long as life is. It's there and gone. It's but a breath. It's a vapor. Don't waste it. We're going to stand before God one day. What track are you on? Okay, Emmy Abe, come up here, please, and share with us. She invested her life this year. We didn't even speak yet. And we're already here for you. We've got uh, this mic. And this, I really hope this will make the point of point one, letter C, cause and effect, invest your life like Emmy Abe. Give her another hand. to go work with the Navajo tribe. So basically, we just did a BBS with, in two places. One in Black Mesa, it had a Baptist church there, which, where we stayed. And then another in the city of Kanta, which was about 20 minutes away. So I was scared, because <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. I was like, OK, I'm going to a new place with no one I knew. <laughs> I think I knew like two people on our team of 38. So I was scared. <laughs> but um, throughout the week, I got to know the people of both in from Arizona and from the church in Oregon that I went with. And it was really encouraging because I got to see their hearts change. Um, I was at Black Mesa, but um, the team that went to Canto, they planted a lot of seeds. They um, got to share with people who didn't know Christ at all. Like, they would go to church, but they didn't know who Jesus was. So that was really encouraging. And I got to see a lot of kids um, accept Jesus as their Savior. And even if some of them didn't, you could see it in their eyes. Like, when they listen to you, they, their eyes would light up. And they're like, they want to know more. They're interested in what you have to say. So that was really encouraging to me. Um, I also got to have or build relationships with the people. So I hope I can go next year too. Um, we had, or I had a really close relationship with this um, girl named Carolyn. She was 10, I think, and she was so sweet. And like, she, um, you could see because where I was. Um, 
The team had been going for the past eight years. You could see her heart for God already. And just how she presented herself and was like loving on everyone. And it was like, you could see God working in her. And it was really encouraging. Um, we also went to go pick up the kids for VBS because a lot of them couldn't like come on their own. So we went to a few of the subdivisions, I guess you'd call them. But when you go to them, you literally have to drive through this pipe, like underneath the railroad to get to their houses. And they live on dirt roads and it's super bumpy and it's kind of crazy when you drive because you have to go super fast or else you're going to get stuck. So it was really interesting. You could see that they lived in a lot of poverty, which hurt really bad because I live here and it's very nice here. But um, yeah, and just seeing where they live was really like eye-opening and like they're like one of the happiest people I know. So I was like, oh my goodness, crying. <laughs> but they were super sweet. And like, um, one of the kids in the um, teenager group, they lived in a tent. And they had to choose. Um, they had pictures. And they had to choose. Um, <laughs> they had to choose their. Um, what they thought their life was. And they chose the big happy family one. And I was like, <laughs> I was crying because I was like, oh my goodness. And they asked why they chose that picture. And they're like, even though I don't have much, I have my family and that makes me happy. And it's just <laughs> so wonderful to see like, even if, um, they felt alone. They had God and their family, and they were content with that. And it was really heartwarming <laughs> because here um, we think we have so little, but <laughs> when you go to a different place, you see they're like so happy <laughs> with just what they have, just having their family there. So <laughs> yeah, it was really just eye-opening for me to go to a different place because this was my first mission and just see like how God works in so much ways and yeah so thank you for your <laughs> prayers and your support and it was really a good experience for me. talking about the truth that Emmy just shared. You know, go home today and say, hey, that's part of Emmy's story about them having to drive fast over the bumpy road so they wouldn't get stuck. Jumped out at me. Or say what parts jumped out. And uh, let Emmy know how you appreciate her being faithful, not only to go with her work, but then also her words to testify and share. All right? And I had a William Carey article. I've had it for a month. I'm going to cut it and not share it again today. Um, I've been wanting to share, but William Borden is going to make it in the message to, to close this up this morning. All right? And that said, to, to finish this up, hopefully you got all these blanks that our work, number one, um, A, is, it's danger, but we need to work on it and time it right. And then there's cause and effect, and ignorance is often the cause of our negative effects under the sun. And then we can cause uneffect if spiritually we've been regenerated by the grace of our Lord Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And now we don't live just for earth, we live for eternity. And we can cause uneffect like Emmy did. And invest our lives to God's glory. Thank you for again for investing in your prayers for Emmy. Some of you gave money um, to help that mission happen. However you invested, thank you. But And how about your block? How about your neighborhood, your family and friends, neighbors and co-workers? What effects do you want to see God cause in their lives? Can you start praying about it and then try stuff? And then using your words. Your words need to be weighty as Christians. We need to take every thought captive, make it obedient to Jesus. And then that PT, that training we do to be on track and stay on track. We need to pray and thank God with our lives and lips. Amen?
Amen. That means you agree. Hopefully we can live it out. One, how has Jesus impacted your life, your work, your words? Two, how can you show God's worth more accurately today and this week with what you say and what you do? And three, what is the main thing God wants you to remember from his word today? Okay, we'll just let this object lesson keep driving home. And close with the little known story of William Borden. By the way, in my Bible, that cover, since uh, August 1st, 2013, I heard my dad preach a message. I actually heard it on the internet and wrote it in in my living room. No reserves, I have fought the good fight. No retreats, I have finished the race. No regrets, I have kept the faith. Um, so I heard that story of William Gordon. And this week, a friend of mine gave me this book that I thought, no way would I have time to read. I'm trying to prepare a message. But because it's so short and concise and so sweet, I got sucked in. And these six words, this is from this book, no reserves, no retreats, no regrets, made a huge impression on me. And here's the story behind them. William Borden, let's just see what happens when it goes off track. So it's not a distraction. Okay, my point was, when this is off track, it doesn't go anywhere. And these are all hopefully lessons that the Holy Spirit will help us with. Okay. okay, to close. William Borden was already wealthy when he graduated from a Chicago high school in 1904. And the priest, go ahead and come up. He was the heir to his family's massive fortune. For his graduation present, William's parents gave him a trip that would take him around the world to countries whose suffering he could never have imagined within the confines of his comfortable life. At some point, as he traveled through Europe, the Middle East, and Asia, a simple burden began to grow heavy in his heart. He wanted to help these people who were far less fortunate than he had ever been. At that moment, William decided to become a missionary once he finished college. He wrote home explaining his decision to family and friends. When he finished his travel, he had, travels, he attended Yale, where he quickly distinguished himself from his typical peers. He started a small morning prayer group, and by his senior year, a thousand students were meeting in similar prayer groups inspired by his. Is that cool, you? That little prayer group, and then we impact others with our faithfulness. William's actions reached even beyond the campus. He founded the Yale Hope Mission in order to rehabilitate drunks forgotten on the streets of New Haven. A friend wrote that William went down to the meetings a great deal and might often be found in the lower parts of the city at night, on the street, in a cheap lodging house or some restaurant to which he had taken a poor, hungry fellow to feed him, seeking to lead men to Christ. What a cool thing to be known for. Given his family's position, he received numerous high-paying job offers after he finished his studies at Yale, but he turned them all down. After completing graduate work at Princeton Seminary, William sailed for Egypt, where he planned to learn Arabic before beginning his missions work in China. But while in Egypt, he was infected with spinal meningitis. The same month, William Borden died at the age of 25. Hevel, vapor. The story of his life and death quickly made its way around American newspapers, capturing the attention of the entire country. His biographer, Mary Taylor, wrote, A wave of sorrow went round the world. Borden not only gave his wealth, but himself, in a way so joyous and natural that it was manifestly a privilege rather than a sacrifice. Don't miss that. So joyous and natural that it was manifestly a privilege rather than a sacrifice. William's all-out dedication to making his life matter is reflected in a story that was circulated after his death. According to the story, William had jotted down resolutions in the back of his Bible each time he faced key decisions in his life. The first, when he decided to become a missionary, no reserves. The second, when he rejected the high-paying job offers, no retreats. And the last, before his death, one, two, three, no regrets. No reserves, no retreats, no regrets. William Borden made every day count. In the process of following his dream to become a missionary to the far corners of the world, he had a remarkable effect on those in his own community. He remained focused on his goal without losing sight of the here and now. Please stand. And in a second, I don't talk the rest of the service.
we get to sing some songs, and then Lauren will close out the service. But I'll be up front, Sean and Cy will both be up front, and then if we have a, a woman here in our church, oh, I took it off too early. Test. If there's a woman here in our church who could receive people to pray, um, if, you, if you've taught or led ministries in our church and love Jesus, if you just come up here, Laura's not here and my wife's not here, so anybody who wants to do that ministry, you can come on up and counsel people. Um, that way, if, if a woman wants to pray with a woman, we want that available. But Sean will be here, Sai, and myself, and hopefully someone from our church. But if not, either way, come pray with us. And whatever God's done in your heart today, would you respond to him in obedience during our invitation? This is a space set aside to respond to God. It's not even 12 o'clock yet, praise the Lord. But let's not waste this time. If God's working in your heart, if there's something that's jumping off the page of God's word that's just stirring in your heart, would you respond to him in obedience during this time of invitation? And then if not, maybe you're like R.C. Sproul, and tonight you go back to your room and get on your knees and talk to God, and then you still see much fruit later in your life. But this is what this space is for. Will you respond however God leads you? I'm done talking, but I'd love to pray with you.